In chapter 7 of The End of Ice, what did you mean by the fuses are lit? That, I, I titled the chapter that way because it was a line that Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, the often referred to as the godfather of biodiversity, an Amazon expert, been studying it since 1965. And I, I was interviewing him in Camp 41, his most famous study camp down there for the book. And he talked about how the fuses are lit on these different parts of the ecosystems of the Amazon. And the problem is we didn't really know enough about the Amazon to know exactly where those fuses are and then how they're going to end up. Uh, essentially, the bombs that they're going to detonate that could essentially be the end of the Amazon as we know it. And he has since come out and warned about crossing over these tipping points. He said, uh, it's estimated that if we lose between 20 and 25 percent of the Amazon rainforest as we know it today, that that would be the threshold at which the rest of the rainforest would essentially just turn into savanna. That you need enough of it to exist to stop that from happening. And the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, estimates we've already lost roughly 17 percent. That doesn't include the amount lost last summer from the fires. We could well already be over that tipping point at which uh, we all, irrevocably the Amazon turns into savanna instead of rainforest. Those are the fuses that, that top, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy warns that we can't be running around lighting them nor letting them burn because if we do that, we could lose the whole thing. And that's what he's really concerned about. And, and so those are the fuses. And you, you hear some of that same language in some of the scientists studying the Antarctic. One of them said, we all know the fuses are all lit. We're just waiting for the bombs to go off. The bombs being, for example, like the Thwaites Glacier that I mentioned earlier, that, that once that comes unplugged and it frees up all that ice, and you have a, an, uh, on a human time scale essentially an in instantaneous being in just a few years probably the amount of ice that is going to come out of that a few years or a couple of decades you're looking at um, relative immediate loss of, of major coastal cities. So those are the kind of fuses that are already lit and, and we're waiting to see the effects of it. You've mentioned a few. What are the top causes of climate change? Well, CO2 emissions, obviously, um, methane emissions from the thawing permafrost, from subsea permafrost in the Arctic, from, the, from industrial agriculture. This is a big one that doesn't get talked about that much. Uh, some, some studies show that there's even more CO2 and methane emissions from industrial agriculture than there is from the fossil fuel industry. That's a really big one uh, because you factor in the amount of uh, desertification caused by industrial agriculture, the, um, how water intensive it is, all of that contributes to uh, a warming planet and more CO2 emissions and less uh, wildlands there to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. So those are, those are really the biggies. While independent media outlets still exist, and there are a lot of them, the major outlets are almost all owned by just six conglomerates. How does the major media being controlled by just six companies affect the public's perception of climate change? Mm -hmm. And that statistic alone is why I got into independent journalism, um, uh, being shocked at the information control, uh, whether it comes to war or climate change or what have you. And the lack of honesty in the corporate media about the crisis and A, that we're in one, B, how far along we already are, and C, what is a realistic response at this point. There's been basically no coverage of that. Uh, the Guardian has done a pretty good job, but I think uh, most people would, in the United States anyway, would probably not consider that a mainstream media source. But that aside, for the most part, um, aside from a few odd decent stories in the New York Times or the Washington Post, um, most of the media is just not covering it accurately. And it's because uh, you look at the advertisers. I mean, I personally don't watch TV, but I know from media analysis, if you look at the lead advertisers in television, when you have Boeing and car companies and oil companies funding so much of the advertisements, um, 
there you have, that's who's driving the bus. So it, it's bad for their business for people to understand, I need to get off fossil fuels, I need to annually be reducing my carbon footprint, I need to be consuming less of everything. It's just bad for business and that flies in the face of what the mainstream media is intent on selling people. In chapter three of The End of Ice, what did you mean by the canary in the coal mine? Hmm. Uh, the canary in the coal mine was uh, an analogy that I used for uh, how the indigenous population that I spoke with uh, several members of on St. Paul Island and the Pribilof Islands. These are a very, very small island group in the Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska. Um, St. Paul has roughly a 234-year-round population, uh, subsistence lifestyle, commercial fishing. Those are the two primary means of, of uh, the way that they feed themselves. And the Aleutian folks that I spoke with out there, several of them referred to themselves as the canary in the coal mine because they are living so close to the land. By, by that I mean their, all of their livelihood and their food comes from um, the ocean and seabirds. And so when climate change makes less seabirds and less marine life available for them uh, for eating as well as for carrying on traditions uh, that they've practiced for millennia, then they're, they're the first ones to feel it. And, and it's having the immediate and most severe impact on their culture. And so they have described themselves, hey, we're the canary in the coal mine. When you start tweaking the, the global climate, we're the ones that are gonna show the signs the most immediately and, and the most severely. And that's true for so many indigenous populations around the globe. And, and that was, in a sense, for me in the book, it was a bit of a case study because it's completely isolated, a very, very small population, and they were absolutely exhibiting very alarming warning signs of what's happening on the planet. Can you sum up in 15 seconds everything we've talked about today? We are in a planetary crisis, and people need to take that in deeply and then make very, very personal decisions about how are they going to cho choose to comport themselves at this moment in history? What's the one thing I need to do today? Hmm. Be very, very honest about this era of endings that we're living in. What is it about the real truth about health conference that made you decide you needed to be here to speak? Climate change is the s cause, it's the single biggest human health crisis ever because it affects everything. Our food availability, water availability, smoke inhalation from wildfires, extreme weather events to if we lose the Amazon, how many future drugs are we losing? Same with coral reefs. The climate crisis affects every aspect of our health and increasingly so going forward. Disease outbreaks, heat waves, you name it. And so I think a conference like this is critical and I think each year will become even more important the deeper into the crisis we get. So that's why I wanted to come. For people that want to learn more about your work, where should they go? I maintain a website. It's darjamail.net. It's D-A-H-R-J-A-M-A-I-L.net. And that's where I archive uh, the articles I've written and where people can find out more about my books as well.